and welcome. It is Friday at 10 o'clock, but full disclaimer, it's actually Thursday at 11 o'clock for me. I am pre-recording this uh, stream only because tomorrow I'm doing an LTA coach workshop down in Heston. Uh, and I want to try and keep these 10 o'clock streams to hopefully build some community and some viewers. Each week I'm getting an extra viewer. So maybe this week I'll be on three viewers, but <laughs> who knows? So yeah, full disclaimer, this is pre-recorded. Um, but yeah, I just want to keep some consistency with uh, the streams. So I hope you all had a good week. Today I'm going to discuss pretty hot topic, um, especially over on Instagram at my tennis coaching. If you haven't already followed, um, over the last few weeks, been putting out quite a lot of content, uh, trying to sort of debunk a few myths around tennis coaches and tennis coaching. Um, and obviously, when you go against the grain and go against tradition and you offer an opinion that's maybe a little bit different to other people it gets a little bit heated on on there and there's been a been a few uh few conversations on there which which is fine listen i've got all respect for people's opinions and people's views but one of the reasons why i set up my tennis coaching is to try and put forward what i believe is 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 good practice and the topic this week um that's really sort of blown up my instagram a little bit is technique Everyone's favorite word, 99%. 9% of you tennis coaches love technique. Players love technique. Parents love technique. And only today I seen a video by ASICS or ASICS, whatever you pronounce it, uh, with one of their pro players talking about the perfect forehand technique. Doesn't exist. No such thing as perfect technique. And we need to get away from this narrative of, Tennis is a very heavily technical game. Tennis is a game that requires unbelievable movement, both footwork, body work, and racket work. That's technique's just a fancy word. It's just, for me, it's a word that, I don't know, maybe was invented by coaches. But movement is, is, is what technique is. If I swing my rackets low to high, it's a movement. If I split step, it's a movement. If I cross over step, it's a movement. If I rotate my hips and shoulders through the ball, body work, it's a movement. So techniques is a fancy word for movement. And the more, I've, I mentioned this last week on the live stream, like tennis coaching made no sense to me because we teach it in isolation. We teach technique in isolation, but the game is very dynamic and very open. So, over the last couple of years, when I've gone into the more constraint-led approach and the more implicit learning approach, and I've looked at, okay, how humans actually learn, the science shows us that, one, we don't learn very well from explicit instruction. And science also shows us that tennis is not very linear. So you can't do X plus Y and equals Z. Tennis is very dynamic and open. And it's interesting because from coach education, like you don't really get to learn this stuff on coach ed. Yeah, you may talk about how people learn in terms of, okay, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. You may look at the, the stages of learning, the cognitive, associative, and autonomous. But a lot of that stuff's outdated as well. Like if you look at the FITS stages of learning model, it's like – what, 60, 80 years old. Sports science has moved on quite a lot since then. And that's a, a model that's based on repetition, but we know that tennis is not a repetitive sport. But the, majority, but the majority of tennis coaches think it is a repetitive sport. You have to repeat the action over and over again because that's how you learn it. Muscle memory. Science shows us that you don't learn that way. Like you don't repeat the same action two times in a row. Like even now, if you if you tap your fingers on the desk, like the action would be slight variations all the time because your bodies adapt not to be repeatable. Because if you if you repeat something over and over again, you get injured. So your body will always make tiny adjustments and always keep things a little bit different because it doesn't want to just constantly have the repetitive strain over and over again. So that's been the sort of background and, and the sort of, so I've been trying to trying to put my opinion out there and a little bit of education. Cause again, in coach education, we, no one tells you this stuff. Like it's only since 
maybe what the past five or six years I've actually gone out there and looked into it myself and I got it from other sports to be fair like I didn't hear about the constraint led approach until I stumbled across a webinar on water polo and it made sense to me because they just learned how to play water polo by playing water polo and the coach's job was to facilitate different different environments so the player learned different skills that they can then put into a water polo match I was like well that's what we should be doing in tennis so why are we doing this very very um archaic and traditional way of coaching so when i've put it out there this week a lot of coaches have been quite quite hot some of them have been hot some have been very receptive and agreed and it's interesting because a lot of a lot of what I would class as the very experienced coaches agree, and a lot of the inexperienced coaches, or a lot of the players, or some of the parents disagree. So I'll definitely take that as a win. Like if if some of the coaches, like uh, Martin Rocker, if he's listened to this top top guy, top coach, like he agrees with my my view, um, and some of the other coaches who I know have similar views to me agree with that view. I think it's all different opinions. But one one comment that keeps getting fired back at me is, yeah, but beginners need to learn technique. Like you can't just put a beginner in a match. Beginners need it more than anyone else. Yes, the top players, you don't work with on their technique because they've got it. But you need a basic of technique, don't you, Steve? You need like the foundation of technique. And then when you get good, you don't need the technical stuff. And someone put on my Facebook yesterday when I put that quote on about Nadal. So Nadal in the quote says he's hit millions of tennis balls, but every ball's been different. And if we have this mindset of repetition is the key, then why does Nadal miss? If he's hit millions of tennis balls, his timing and, and, and his technique should be flawless. He's done it a million times. Because every ball is different, like he said in the quote. Every ball is completely different. He never gets the same ball twice. And more often than not, because the, the environment changes, he'll just make the, the the wrong decision. That's why he makes a mistake. Because he's human. He's not a robot. You can't program a human just to, to repeat the same action over and over again. Well, not yet anyway, until chat GPT and, a, and AI take over the world. And maybe then we have techniques. So all those technical tennis coaches... When you're coaching robots, this, this might be might be your time, but until then, it's not quite so. So, so the argument of okay, well, let's 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 develop the basics. So the word basics been used quite a lot this week on my Instagram and Facebook. Fundamentals as well has been used quite a lot. And on a workshop that I did, or a coach qualification, it was on the weekend. Um, Daniel, shout out to Daniel if you're watching this. I know you just follow me on Instagram, but Daniel asked as well. But yeah, but surely beginners need it. And it's probably the most common question I get. Yeah, but beginners need it, Steve. Beginners need a foundation of technique. But what does that mean? So let's let's use the forehand, for example. So what's the basics of a forehand? What's that mean? What's the basics? So let's say I come to your lesson, never played tennis in my life. You're going to teach me the basics of a forehand. So what a coach might teach me, how to stand. Okay, so they might teach me a closed stance or open stance if they're crazy. Um, they may teach me the grip, how to hold a racket. Okay, they may teach me how to do a C-shape. Shout out to the C-shape uh, coaches out there. I'll definitely think of a C word for coaches who use a C-shape. Um, but yeah, so they might teach me the C-shape. Might teach me to follow through. I've seen that a lot recently as well, okay. High elbow over the shoulder, follow through. So, okay, so you, you taught me the basics of the shot. Great. I'm now equipped to play a forehand. And then you and then you feed me a ball. Yeah. Some success here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, C shape. Yeah. Okay. And the coach is feeding you the ball. I'm, I'm growing in confidence. I'm getting more shots in court. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So we might start with some drop feeds. Oh, so good. Then some hand feeds, oh, even better. I'm, I'm getting better now. The ball's actually coming towards me. Oh my God, the coach is racket feeding me now. These basics are are just are, are amazing. Okay, so we're getting towards the end of my lesson. And I've done this lesson, by the way. So I'm not like preaching here. I've done this lesson hundreds, possibly thousands of times. But I've worked on the basics. I've worked on the technique because that's how I was taught in coach education how to coach. I've done this lesson. This is me I'm talking about. 
but also 90% of the coaches I see coach. Um, so I've got the basics and then you put me in a match and those basics disappear. About 40 minutes, hard work. I've hit loads of balls. I've hit, let's say, 350 balls with my forehand. I hit 350. I'm working towards Fitz's model of a thousand. Yeah, once I get to a thousand, I then go into the next stage of learning. Um, but I can't play in a rally. I can't play tennis. So what? Why is that? Well, as tennis coaches, we are educated. We are taught to decouple or decompose or break down technique to develop the basics. I'm going to stop doing that because it's, it's annoying me. The basics. Because we need to develop a, a foundation of skill, which kind of makes sense, I guess. Okay, so can you break? So if my car was broken, could I take something out and fix it and put it back in? The car runs smoothly. Absolutely. But again, we're not machines. We're humans. We can't, we can't take something out, fix it, and then put it back into a, a dynamic and constantly moving a constantly moving environment. It, that just doesn't work that way. So what happened in that lesson I just talked about, the example, again, which I've done a hundred times, that, that, that was me 10 years ago. So what I've done there is I've isolated and developed a very closed set of skills. Again, if we use skills as movement, so a little bit of body work, a little bit of racket work, a little bit of footwork. Okay, so I've isolated it. I've given the player a ball in which they can achieve that very small set of basic. Sorry, stop doing it. That that small that small selection of basic skills. I've given them the ball on a plate. So, once you get into an open situation, the ball comes at a different height, a different speed, different spin, different position. So I need a wider range of skills. I have to deal, I have to have the skill of moving to a wide ball. I have to have a skill of moving to a short ball. I have to have the skill of hitting from way behind the baseline. I have to have the skill of hitting the ball up close in the midcourt. I have to have the skill of taking the ball early, taking the ball late. If the ball comes quick, I have the skill to defend. If the ball floats up, I have the skill to attack. But you've given me one very specific skill of that single ball. 350 times and I might get one of them in a match I might hit a thousand forehands in a match and I might hit one of those shots so great if I get that one shot I can get I, I, I can do that no problem so what so what does what have you achieved as a coach what did I achieve as a coach nothing I've just justified you paying me money by teaching you something by using words and using technical words like a closed stance and C shape and it might give you some tactical input as well if you're really lucky it might tell you where to hit the ball how often do we see coaches and the players are just hitting the ball and there's no tactical outcome attached to it like well okay that makes no sense whatsoever either so what have I achieved as a coach absolutely nothing like to me, that just makes no sense. The basics, like what, what, what does that mean? The basics of what? Now, to me, fundamentals, and I agree, we all need an underlayer of fundamentals. But fundamentals are skills like agility, balance, coordination, speed. Fundamentals of like head or mental skills, like resilience and focus and confidence and calmness and mind and and, and being present. These are all fundamental skills that people need and players need. And the majority of players will come into your coaching sessions with those skills already being developed if they're young or are developed sort of within adults. So your job is to teach the player of how to deal with the environment that's in front of them. And that environment depends obviously on the player. If you've got an adult beginner, Okay, so they're not going to have to deal with a heavy topspin, the Dal forehand coming at them. They're probably going to have to deal with a, a low, flat, punchy shot from their opponent because that's the level they're playing at. So you've got to give them that experience. They're going to move very laterally, side to side. 
Yeah, they're not going to be breaking away from the baseline and sort of doing the Spanish cross and sort of cutting off angles and breaking angles. They've got to be able to get the ball back in on both sides. That's the basics they need to learn. They need to learn to deal with the demands of the game. And that might have an element of movement in there. That might have an element of the balance with the close stance. It might have an element of the low to high swing or the path of the racket, but it depends. It all depends. And someone fired back at me this week on Instagram that, okay, well, if you're saying that players just learn by playing the game, then why do you need a coach? Kind of makes your job redundant. No, it doesn't. That, that's, that, that's just a, a silly thing to say. Because my job as a coach is to give you that wide range of experience to suit your level. And then when you get those wide ranges of, of skill to your level, we then look to level up and make it even better and get you onto the next level. So if you're an adult beginner and you come to my sessions, we will play tennis. We'll play practices that are at your level. And again, I might I might hit with you with a chopper grip and I'll, I'll punch and I'll play like an adult, an adult beginner. If you're a national level junior, I'll play with like an under 10 national level junior. I'll give you what you can expect in a match. And again, part of me thinks that's fake in a private lesson. I'm one of those crazy coaches who don't believe too much in too many private lessons because even like, even in a session this week that I did with a with an under 10 player, I can't hit like a 10 year old. A 10 year old hits like a 10 year old. I hit like a 40 year old man trying to be a 10 year old. So, so even that's a little bit fake. So, so as a coach, we need to set up those environments and give the player a wide range of skills. And coaches and parents and players, they, they may see clips of pro players doing very isolated skills. But you have to understand that these are like the pro players, but like F1 cars. In F1, you're looking to get 1% difference. So you might tweak something very small to get that very small marginal gain. That's what the pro player does. If they are, if they work on an isolated shot, it might be a case of they're playing against someone and they're going to use this shot effectively or how to deal with a certain shot. It's that 1% pro-level mentality of just that marginal gain, what, what might make a big difference. With a beginner who's coming in, they don't need to make 1%. They need to make 90% of skill. They've got a huge skill gap to fill. So doesn't it make more sense giving them a wide range of skills, not just a very isolated, has a forehand. You need to give them 200 forehands, forehand attack, forehand defense, forehand wide. If you think about if you think about every single position the ball can land on the forehand side of the court, it's probably more than 200. But every single one of those shots is going to be slightly different. And you can't coach that. You can't coach him 200 forehands. But what you can do as a coach, and this is where our job is, and this is what the, or the role of the job is, is, you can give them the experience of hitting as many forehands as possible. Like to me, that's that's more beneficial to the beginner because you're developing the skill. And I don't use the word technique with my players anymore. I use the word skill because that's what it is. It's a skill. Technique on its own is just a movement, but skill, skill, um, Sorry, movement plus plus pressure equals skill. Like, and that's what it is. We we need skilled tennis players. We don't need technically great tennis players. And I use people like Medvedev and Tiafo all the time. Look at Tiafo's forehand. I was at Wimbledon this year, and, and I put a clip on my Instagram, and I said, "Who would change his forehand?" And eighty percent of people said they'll change it. In the few DMs, like, "Oh, it's ugly. I'll definitely change it. Not on my watch." This guy's top ten in the world. Is he effective and efficient with that shot? Yes. So why on earth would you change it? Why would you change Medvedev? World number one, Grand Slam finalist. Oh, yeah, but maybe change it. And and, and then another classic quote is, especially with juniors who have interest in technique or movement. Oh, yeah, but when you get to a certain level, they get find out. So there's a clip this week of my mate, <laughs> Monotoglu, Um He's not my mate. We definitely don't think. Yeah, I won't, I won't go into the monotoglu talk at the minute. Um, and he had to play with two forehands on each side. 
and I was talking about it and uh, at the coach qualification at the weekend, and, and some people were like, oh, yeah, but once he reaches a certain level, he'll get found out. I was like, we, we don't know that. Like, yes, it's efficient and effective at the moment, and he's going to have to adapt because once he gets to a certain level, that ball's going to be coming quicker. He's going to have less time, going to have less space. He's going to have to find a way of swapping hands quite quick and quite and, quite, and making sure that... He, that, that he's secure and balanced. So he's going to have to adapt his movement technique. But if he adapts, then he'll be fine. But if he, if, if he can't adapt, then yes, he won't quite make it. But you can't say he's not going to make it because it looks off. Again, Santoro double-handed on both sides. He made it. Didn't look great. So why do coaches why do coaches have this belief that tennis is technical? I think education. I think definitely again if I think about coach education, even now in this in this in the UK, a lot of it is model based and isolating drills and close and practices, even though science and biology tells us we don't learn that way efficiently and effectively. We do learn that way, but it's not the most optimum reason. And when I've asked that question, it's normally, oh, coaches coaches need need a lot of experience to be more constraint-led or game-based. So they, they, they need a framework, which I, I don't kind of agree with. I think, well, surely we should start at, at, at the very beginning. Like we, we, we should be exploring how people learn optimize wise again i'm not a scientist i'm not a sports scientist i'm not very academic i'm just a tennis coach but from the research i've looked into it if you learn a skill in isolation here i think is the biggest plus you'll make progress really quick you make really quick progress because you because you're given something to follow you're given a a, a framework a step-by-step -step guide of how to hit the forehand so the progress you made is pretty quick. So as so from a coach's point of view, as a, again the classic one of the week was well, the way you're talking, like you're trying to put coaches out of business. I'm a tennis coach by the way, and I run a coaching business, and a big part of my income is tennis lessons. So that makes no sense for me. Um, oh, you, you're almost making out that you don't need a coach. You're gonna put us all out of business. So from a coaching point of view, if I if I isolate and close down a drill and you make great progress, you're going to think I'm like, I'm amazing. I've literally just turned water into wine in 40 minutes. I've turned your forehand from something you couldn't hit to something now you can hit into the court. Wow, this guy's an expert. Also, if I close it down and give you lots of technical information, God, do I sound good. I sound amazing. I'm, I'm, I've got, I know what, I'm so good. I'm, I'm like, I'm like a textbook of tennis. So all the way so straight away, I, I I sound like a an expert, and and you're paying me as an expert. So if I sound like an expert, then you believe believe in the show. I must know what I'm talking about. If I talk about ground reaction force and inertia, and this is what Rafa does, and this is what Coco Goff does, and yeah, if you do this, you have the perfect forehand. If I think back to that ASICS advert today, business point of view is great. Player makes quick progress. You sound like an expert. You sound like an authority figure. But you know the disadvantage of closing the drill down and teaching explicitly and teaching technique? The odds on you actually using the same movement pattern within a pressured situation are minimal. So the chances of you replicating the skill when put under challenge are very low. That's what science, that's not me, that's science telling you. And you just have to look at the uh, Perception Action podcast. And he's got a great website with loads of science papers on there who backs this up. You only have to look at the constraint-led approach research papers from Newell and stuff like that to back this up. So this is, again, this is science, this is fact, this is not opinion. Research shows that you can't do it under pressure. So when we play tennis, what do we play under? Challenge, we play under pressure. When we play tennis, do we have someone hitting the ball straight to us? No, we have someone trying to make it difficult for us. 
when we play tennis, do we hit from the same position all the time? No, we play from multiple positions. So the odds on your players replicating that technique under challenge are minimal. So therefore, 10 lessons are wasted because you've just taught something that they don't actually need. It's like teaching me Spanish, if I, but if I never go to Spain, I don't need it. It's just irrelevant. It's like teaching me Spanish, and then I go to, I don't know, um, Germany. So you've taught me something great. I can, I, I, I can speak some Spanish. If I, if I meet a Spanish person in Germany, I'm in, I'm in luck. But if I can't speak German, then you've given me a skill that I probably only need if I run into the random Spanish person. A bit like if I hit that one forehand we talked about before. So that's that's the drawback. The other the other challenge that, that that I get pushed my way is yeah, but if you put an adult beginner in a match, it's just it's it's just too much. It's overload. That I agree with. I actually agree with that statement. I think when you do get a beginner, like tennis is challenging. It is difficult, but they don't have to play yellow ball full court and play a free set match in lesson one. You can adjust. The equipment, green ball, orange ball, orange baseline. In extreme cases, play some touch tennis, sponge ball. And people have, again, if you think about pickleball, pickleball is really popular at the moment. People are going, yeah, it's dead easy to pick up and play. It is. Why? Because you don't need a big skill level to play pickleball. Limited movement. You, le you need limited perception because because the space is small. The ball is slow. Just generally, from, from what I've seen, most clubs, it's doubles. So it's it's actually really easy because the skill level is quite small. You can do that with a tennis court. It's called mini tennis or touch tennis. But but adults won't want to play on a red court, but they could play on, a, on, a, on an orange court. They could play on a green ball court. But again, as, as tennis coaches, like how often with an adult beginner do you actually use a slower ball very rarely most of you would just use battered old tennis balls that don't bounce or you use brand new balls which are bouncing up and over their head so i so i get the fact that we can't put an adult into a match but you can just modify the equipment modify the situation reduce the court space if they can't get around the court that quick reduce the court space until they have the skill goes back to what i said before like you will teach an adult beginner how to play good adult beginner tennis and then you level them up and they play at a higher level. Your job as a coach, and again, it goes back to the comment before about making coach redundant. No, you, you, your job as a coach is to get them to the level that they need to meet the demands of their game. And then you try and level them up. And it's not by this whole thing of let me teach him the basics. Basics of what? The forehand doesn't exist. And if you're looking at YouTube and Instagram, Again, there's there's a coach this week. I won't name the coach, but the coach is on Instagram and they're saying how to hit the perfect forehand and they're dancing to some music. Good music, by the way. Trend of music, always good for Instagram. Um, and they're saying, okay, racket has to go back this way. Racket drops below the wrist, 45 degree angle, hit the ball in front of your tennis shoes, finish high over your shoulder. Follow for more. Great. One, you didn't hit a ball. So that's irrelevant. Two, that's great if the ball lands in that exact space at that exact height and the exact speed. That would all work perfect. But this person, this coach, fair play to them. I've got a lot of followers, more followers than me. But that's one of the issues that we're now facing with social media because parents see stuff like that and players see stuff like that. And they'll look at the follower account and go, yeah, but they've got like loads of followers, so they must know what they're talking about. Mona Toglu is the best example. A million followers. Half the stuff he talks about is technical and it's jargon and it's a load of rubbish. But people look at him as the best coach in the world. And, you know, he's, he's yeah, he is a great coach and he's done great things. And he's been Grand Slam finals and he's worked with some of the best players in the world. But stuff he puts out on Instagram, he does it for views. He does it for clicks. He does it to promote his academy and his resort. He's not doing it to help you. He's doing it because he's a great marketing machine. But people look at stuff like that and think, oh, that's how I need to hit my forehand. No. 
Yeah, it is if you're that player in that uh, in that very specific time. And what he does, to to be fair to him, is he will make improvements with the individual player, and I and, and I think that's great. How he does it, I'm not too convinced on because again, it's very explicit and very do do it this way. And I'm the expert, and I'll make you better. And he always seems to make the player better. Like one minute they can't do it, the next minute they can. Wow, like unbelievable coaching. If only he had like a tennis business to promote. So that's the that's 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 the, the problem we're dealing with, and then we're dealing with tradition as well. So a lot of coaches who come and coach qualifications with me, their mentors are traditional tennis coaches. They'll close drills down, they'll isolate drills because one, that's all they know; two, that's what they believe is right. And I and I love I love the argument. Yeah, but I've produced loads of players this way. But then you look at the players they've produced, and like they've played loads of matches. And my argument there is they probably haven't learned from your lessons because they're absolutely dull lessons and you're isolating skill. They've learned through all the match play they've done. And it's a bit like the Spanish system. People, people again, another pushback to me is, yeah, but look at the Spaniards. The Spaniards do loads of closed drills and it's all about head, heart and legs and they work them real high intensity. Yep, yeah, they do. But if you actually look at the Spanish system, they'll that's only a small part of their programme. They'll do the isolated basket, head, heart, and legs drills. But look at how many matches they play. They'll do the drills in the morning. They'll play matches in the evening. They'll play matches all, all weekend, Saturday and Sunday. They're playing matches all the time. So they're developing their true skill in the match play. The isolated stuff, they probably are developing that resilience and that grit and the intensity. They're not developing the... the the, the the tennis skill that way and again it's just it just boggles my mind and i feel let down as a coach because i because i believe the system let me down because i coached that way for years and it's not until you actually look at the sports science and you look into the research of how people learn that you understand that we're probably teaching backwards we're trying to, re <laughs> we're almost trying to reverse engineer something that we can't put back in. Going back to the car example before, we're trying to fix something from a, a moving object and then trying to put it back in. But we're not built. But we're not built that way. So there you go. There's um, my little rant and discussion about technique and movement. Again, people won't agree. Don't, don't expect everyone to agree. What I do is, or what I request, I should say, is people have an open mind and look into it yourself. Look into how people learn. Look into, okay, the research. That's what I've done. I've looked into the, the, the actual research of, is this the most efficient way to coach? And I've been going down this pathway. I'm still fairly new into it. I've been doing it for three or four years, five years or so now, but I'm still new into it. I'm still learning. Like this week, I've stopped using the word drill because you don't drill using the constraint-led approach. You play. So now I've started using practice design. Like over the last few weeks, I was doing very linear, very isolated testing. Now I understand after this week from doing some research and doing some coach education, like... Well, it's probably not the best way of doing it because you're, you're again you're isolating and you're testing an isolated skill, but that's not a true reflection of a player. So I'm learning every day. I'm reading, I'm watching webinars, I'm listening to podcasts. Please check out a couple of podcasts for you. Uh, the Talent Equation is a really good one. The Perception Action Podcast is a really good one. Have a look into Richard Shuttleworth. Follow um, Sean Malkin. Good, good tennis coach on Instagram. He's doing some great work in this space. And there's there's very few coaches working in this space, but I can tell you from my experience, I've never had happier and more skillful players in my life than I have now. I don't think I've ever been as confident in my coaching ability than I do right now as well. In terms of content this week for my Tennis Coaching Guild, really special webinar released today which i filmed just before this um the stream a session of me coaching so i am on call with an under nine player we are using this constraint-led approach so you see some practice design in there uh, but it's all about feedback 
It's all about communication and, inter and interventions. And you will see how I don't traditionally feedback to the player. So what do I mean by traditional feedback? Lots of no's. So coaches telling you what you can't do. Lots of explicit language of what to do and how to do it and when to do it. So you won't see any of that. You will see me talk to the player. The player will make the majority of the decisions. The player is self-guided. My job is to facilitate and I use questions and I use examples of, uh, sorry, I, I'll use the practices themselves to sort of teach. So if you're interested in, okay, well, you're preaching here of how, how not to coach in many ways. Let's see how you do it. Well, th there you go. There's, there's, there's an opportunity there to, to actually do it. Um, it is obviously free for the guild members. So you have to be a guild member to, to view. You can rent the video. You can just buy the video. You got access to it all the time. Or you can try to guild out for just a pound for a month. And you can try all the webinars. And I've got lots of webinars on all this stuff I've talked about today. I've got, I think, over 17 webinars now, over 50 articles on this. So if you are interested in this method, it is a work in progress. Like I said before, I'm learning as I go along. And part of the reason for the guild is to chart my progress as a coach on this journey and hopefully share ideas. Let me know if you have any questions, any comments, leave it in uh, the comments below. And then obviously once the streams tomorrow, when I come back from the workshop, I'll try and answer any questions back. If you do have any strong opinions against it, leave it down as well. But what I would say, if you do have strong opinions, please be respectful. Again, sometimes people go, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Who are you? You've never done anything in tennis. And then you look at the coaches who are saying that and they're, they're like instructor coaches level two and they're literally two years in. Okay, well, at least be respectful, mate. Come on. I won't mention who you are, but we know who you are on Instagram. Um, but yeah, but please, please do be respectful because again, I will offer counter arguments. Doesn't mean that my way, well, I believe in, in, in my way. You might not. That's up to you. That's your choice. And if you choose not to, then that's absolutely fine by me. But please do be respectful if you do comment down below because um, I want this to be discussion. I want it to be open. I want it to be uh, to fuel ideas because one of the reasons again for setting up the community guild sorry the guild was community like i want coaches to share coaches do not share information coaches are so guarded coaches don't want to help each other out because they're seeing each other as as rivals and there's a facebook post of a week a guy asking for help to go and visit clubs to get ready for his level three and a lot of the comments are like why would you come to my club to steal my players like what are you talking about mate chill out meant to be all in this together and help each other and there's just such an ego around coaches again people think that i preach on here but i'm not i'm just trying to highlight all the mistakes i've made and if you can avoid those mistakes i was coaching what i now perceive as the wrong way for 15 years and i was quite successful doing it but like if you can maybe avoid making 15 years of mistakes and jump on with me at this point, then it's going to save you time. That's why I'm doing these things. It's not to be preachy or this is my way and you have to follow it. Okay, it's my opinion. It's a bit like when we work with players. We offer players opinions all the time. It's up to them whether or not they take that opinion. They don't have to take it. So it's a bit like this. I will offer my experience. I'll offer what research that I do. I'll offer the insights. You take with it as much or as little as you want. And yeah, next week, uh, let me just check. Am I around next week for a live stream? Because I would like to get maybe people on the call and discuss this uh, next week. Yes, I'm around next week. So I'll be live at 10 o'clock on YouTube and Facebook. I'm trying to find a way of doing it on Instagram Live as well. But I just don't want like loads of cameras up because at the minute I just use... Uh, a software which I can stream to Facebook and YouTube at the same time without sort of streaming separately. Uh, but I will be live next week at 10 o'clock. If you want me to discuss anything in particular, leave it down in the comments um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up next week. So there we go. Fundamentals, basics. What do they truly mean? Are we trying to teach technical players or are we trying to teach skillful players? I'll leave that question with you for the week. Have a great week and I'll speak to you all again soon.